Back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Newfeld, Mr. Blazer, people represented by Ms. Clark, Mr. Darden, Mr. Escobar, Mr. Wooden. Morning, counsel. Mr. Blazer. Yes, Your Honor. Yesterday we were provided with uh, uh, two more charts, or at least proofs of charts, that uh, the prosecution intends to use with Mr. Dietrich. I wanted to bring our objections to the court's attention now so that the prosecution can have time to change these before Mr. Dietrich testifies. Uh, I don't know if the court's been provided with these or not. These are two no, I have not. comparison charts. Uh, perhaps I could provide you with mine. All right, Mr. Robertson, would you uh, make a quick photocopy for me, please? Or do you have additional copies? No, I don't. I have my own here. The uh, charts purport to show comparisons between various known samples and various evidence samples. Uh, the, they indicate that known samples are consistent with evidence samples, and we don't have a problem with that. That's, that's the way these things are described. What we have a problem with is two things. Uh, they have pictures on these to demonstrate what the known samples are. Uh, as you can see on the hair chart, they have defendant. Now, the proof that you have doesn't have the pictures on it. The picture they want to put on this is the mugshot of Mr. Simpson. And then they have uh, other pictures titled Nicole, Ron, uh, with pictures from the crime scene of the dead bodies. Uh, we feel that that's clearly unduly prejudicial, that it's intended to inflame the jury. Uh, it's certainly not necessary uh, to have Mr. Simpson's mugshot to demonstrate that exemplar Harris came from him. Uh, all of these uh, boxes to show the associations of the hair and fiber evidence with the evidence talk in terms of Ron's shirt, Nicole's dress. They are not referred to by their last names, which is the conventional way to do that in court. Uh, I think it's not coincidental that they use the names Ron and Nicole and defendant rather than O.J., Simpson, and Goldman. I think that was done for a specific purpose to uh, show a contrast between Mr. Simpson with his booking photo and the victims. And I think it's, uh, it's unnecessary to the purpose of this chart, and we object to those aspects of the chart. We would request that they use last names as, as they've used in other charts, I believe, and not be allowed to use the defendant's mugshot. Ms. Clark, do you have the actual uh, board available? No, you are, and that's why I very much appreciate counsel's taking this up at this time because once we finalize the board to um, change it, it's very difficult, and with the court's ruling this morning, we'll be able to finalize the board. Let me indicate to the court, number one, um, to obviate the one argument made by counsel, we are not using the crime scene photographs of the victims in as they were found at Bundy for the um, identifying pictures in the hair uh, summary board. We are using live photographs of them. Uh, with respect to... All right, we've already seen two live photographs uh, of both uh, Ms. Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman. I think they're the same two-year-old that we've used before. Mrs. Robertson, I think they're in the book in the front box. Those are people's exhibits 29 and 27. Same ones. And All right. we're using the same ones again. Only small. All right. Um, also, I take it you're not using the Time Magazine booking photo. I'm sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> Never mind. I didn't hear the question. Which? Okay. Never mind. Which Time booking magazine. photo were you oh, using? I'm not using the Time Magazine photograph. No, Your Honor. Um, with respect to type for the to the um, other objections, let me indicate to the court, Mr. Sheck made certain objections to me about these boards. And uh, of the objections he made, I found one to be uh, a fair objection, which was we initially had the boards entitled simply hairs and then the other one fibers. <coughs> Mr. Sheck objected on the grounds that the arrows simply going from the defendant, Nicole, Ron, Cato the dog, for example, to the items 
um, inferred identity or uniqueness mm -hmm. where the witness's testimony would really just say consistent with. Um, and even though I felt that his testimony would clarify that and would indicate with no, in no uncertain terms that we are not indicating through his testimony uniqueness. And it was nice and simple this way, simply having to title hairs with the arrows, fewer words. I thought that perhaps if there was any indication by such a title that we are trying to indicate uniqueness, that it, it would be unfair and it is untrue. And I intend to bring it out completely and fully with Mr. Diedrich that we are not indicating uniqueness or identity. So what we did is I asked that the boards be modified to indicate fibers of for the exemplar items, then consistent with and fibers of, and the same thing is going to be done with hairs. So I did modify the boards to that extent. So the arrows are gone? No, the arrows are there because it indicates the transfer, but the title indicates that it is not identity we're saying. We're saying it's consistent with, uh -huh. and that will be the testimony as well. So now there is no misleading, no arguably misleading aspect to it. All right, well then the two things we need to discuss from what I understand from Mr. Blazier's comment is the use of the booking photo and the use of the first names, the use of defendant and the comparison of the uh, Ron and Nicole. I don't, I, I don't, there's no objection to Cato the dog. I don't know what his last name is, Your Honor. So <laughs> with respect to Ron and Nicole, we use their first names because they're shorter. I wanted to make these boards as simple as I possibly could. I really honestly did not think had no conscious thought of the, of the uh, psychological aspects that counsel is mentioning. Um, it seemed simple and short. They've been referred to in testimony repeatedly as Ron and Nicole. And in fact, some of our boards refer to the defendant as OJ. We have se section um, item number 231, fibers, rear cargo, OJ Bronco. I mean, we, people are referred to by their first names throughout this trial, and this is no exception. There's, I don't think the psychological impact that counsel is worried about. With respect to the use of the booking photo, it's a, it's a fair depiction of the defendant. I'll, I'll show the court the, the photograph, but what are we supposed to do? Show him carrying the football over the, uh, I mean, this is a fair depiction of the defendant with his hair, and the hair is the important thing here. We, and and it's one full headshot. There's nothing. All right, may I see the photograph, please? Certainly. I mean, there aren't numbers on his. This is going to be in that fashion. Right now there's a name tag, but it's going to be in this fashion. A name tag? There's a name tag underneath. I say a photo name tag. Right. All right, may I see the photograph? All right, Mr. Blazier, I think the people have uh, obviated your objection to the photographs of Ms. Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman. Not at all, Your Honor. May I be heard? Sure. Uh, we strenuously object to the two professionally taken photographs of the victims and a mugshot of Mr. Simpson. We suggest if they, they don't need pictures at all, you don't need to look at a picture of any of these people. None of the hair comparisons are going to be done based on a photograph. It's going to be done based on microscopic analysis. Uh, if they have to use pictures, they can use driver's license photos of all three. That would at least be equal in terms of the way that they're produced. Um, as to the names, OJ is a lot shorter than all the names they have on here. Defendant is shorter uh, or is longer than Goldman. I think that's a ridiculous reason to give. They should all be stated in the same way. Your Honor, he is the defendant. No, I, I mean, he I is. That. Okay. With respect to the photographs, I, I don't know. I think that, that too much is, is being made of this. The people are entitled to use the best photographs they can to depict what's an issue here. And the photographs uh, that we have selected have been selected because their hair is shown clearly in these photographs. Whereas in driver's license photographs, they aren't nearly as well depicted. Those are not professional shots. The booking photo of the defendant is a professional shot, Your Honor. That person does it for a living. My recollection of Mr. Goldman's driver's license is that he's wearing some kind of bandana. Correct. Which obscures his hair. Mm -hmm. Let me also indicate, um, with respect to the, the, with respect to the photographs on the fiber, 
board. <coughs> the boxes for Ron shirt, pants, um, and the knit hat and glove show those items in the crime scene photographs in context. And the reason that they are shown in that manner, the victims are not shown. You know what I mean? The faces are not shown, but their bodies are shown. Let me show the court what I'm talking about. So that With respect to the uh, jeans, with respect to the glove, we have these items depicted in the crime scene Thank because you. the context in which these items exist are very important to explain the transfer of hair and fiber. What we're, what we're showing by these boards is that they receive the hairs and fibers that they did as a result of contact <coughs> between the defendant and both victims and items of fiber that he transferred to them and that was transferred between them. And so the context in which the bodies are found, their location in vis-a-vis -vis each other and the items of evidence that was found, were found near them is very important uh, to explain the evidence and why we find it where we do. So that's why we use those photographs for the boards, the fiber boards, as opposed to separate photographs taken in the lab. Okay. All right. You know, we will provide a, a picture of Mr. Simpson if the court feels that pictures are necessary to any of this. We don't think they are, but we should be provided the opportunity to provide a photograph rather than a mug shot. All right. Do you have a photograph that's contemporaneous to the uh, time? Yes. Yes. Our position is these are all argumentative. We don't think there should be any pictures at all. If there are to be pictures, they should be of equal quality. All right. Thank you, counsel. With regards to this? No. All right. Well, let me. Okay, sure. While I have the train of thought going here. All right. As to the uh, use of photographs of uh, Ms. Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman, um, I agree that the uh, photograph does depict. Uh, their uh, facial characteristics and their hair, which is the whole issue here. And the objection uh, will be overruled as to the use of the photograph of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Uh, as to the use of the photograph of Mr. Simpson, uh, this is a professionally taken photograph. I mean, this is a photographer employed by the Los Angeles Police Department who took this photograph. The relevance is its proximity and time to the events. Uh, of June the 12th, and it depicts Mr. the condition of Mr. Simpson's hair at a time contemporaneous or almost contemporaneous to the time in question. And it appears to be dated June the 13th, so I find the objection, um, which I take to be a 352 objection, I find that the probative value here uh, clearly outweighs any prejudicial impact. It appears to be a normal photograph. Uh, I will direct the prosecution, however, to uh, delete the uh, name tag uh, at the bottom. As to the uh, photographs of the shirt of Ronald Goldman, uh, the shirt itself appears to be uh, one of the lab demonstration photographs that the jury has already seen. I'll overrule the objection to that. The pants does depict uh, Mr. Goldman in the uh, planter area. It does depict a, uh, the presence of uh, the ferns and the other, uh, the agapanthus plants and other material and uh, actu accurately depicts the state in which Mr. Goldman was found vis-a-vis -vis hair fiber and other debris that's found. So I'll over the rule the objection on that. However, as to the nomenclature on the board, uh, I think we need to be consistent on that. And I think that the dignity of the victims indicates that they should be referred to by their formal names. 
All right, and that the defendant should also be referred to by his formal name. All right, that's the court's order. Are we clear? Ms. Clark? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, I'm All right, Ms. Robertson. All right, Mr. Uh, Cochran, you had one other matter? Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you. The court recalled yesterday that the court had um, instructed the people to give us the list of their remaining witnesses at 9 o'clock today. Ah, uh, yes. And we're 9 18 we're, now. We're so curious. Yes, we want to know. So uh, I'm just calling to inquire on that. Your Honor, Mr. Hodgson will be down a little later in the morning with that information at about 10 30. That's okay. That's fine. 10 30 is fine. You want to <coughs> one other item, if I may? Mr. Newfeld. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, Your Honor, it came to our attention yesterday uh, that um, Mr. Uh, Rockney Harmon uh, sent another letter to uh, Dr. Kerry Mullis. Um, you may recall two things about this, Your Honor. One is that uh, you were concerned. Right. This is not a matter we need to take up right now. I want to use the time in front of the jury with the may jury. I, may I take this up with you right after the lunch break then? Yeah, let's take it up at the lunch break. Thank you very much. Okay. Do you have a copy of the letter available? I do. Okay, why don't you give that to Mrs. Robertson so I can peruse it. Great. All right. All right, Deputy McNair, let's have the jurors, please. Let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Ms. Brockbank, would you resume the uh, witness stand, please? All right, good morning, Ms. Brockbank. Good morning. Uh, you are reminded, ma'am, that you are still under oath. And Ms. Clark, you may conclude your direct examination. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Brockbank, there was one uh, last item that I think we did not cover, item 285. <clears throat> On the date of August the 23rd, 1994, were you visited at the SID lab at LAPD by Mr. Diedrich? Yes, I was. And when you were paid that visit, did you recover a piece of an item of evidence and examine it with him? Yes, I did. And what was that item? Um, that was the uh, shirt of Ronald Goldman, item number 81. And where did you recover it from? From the serology freezer, from the um, box that it was packaged in. And in what manner was it packaged when you recovered it from the serology freezer? It was still in its uh, paper bag. And was it taped shut? I believe so, yes. Was there some kind of a seal across it? Um, tape. And the tape was undisturbed? As I recall, yes. Where is it that you took the shirt to? Um, we examined it on a laboratory bench in the um, serology unit, um, following my normal procedures. <laughs> Clean paper, gloves, lab coat? Yes. And was Mr. Diedrich also I don't know. How was he dressed? Um, he had on gloves. I don't believe he had on a lab coat. 
what exactly did you do with the with Ron Goldman's shirt? Um, we uh, basically processed it a second time, scraping it down using the large spatula, like I described before, um, over the white paper to um, see if we could collect additional trace evidence, hairs and fibers, that sort of thing, from the shirt. Did you examine the spatula first or cleanse it in any way to make sure that it was clean? Yes. And what is it you did with the spatula? Um, rinsed it, you know, with ethanol and wiped it down, made sure there were no hairs or fibers on it. And then you collected the debris that you scraped off of the shirt on August 23rd <coughs> into a bindle? Um, actually, this time we, we placed the debris in a Petri dish, which is um, basically like the pill boxes I was describing yesterday, only it's um, what we have in our lab is a square rather than a circular dish, and it's plastic. Um, that's uh, a photo of it right there. Okay, we're showing right now on the screen a photograph that is taken from the board of, that is People's 436 for item 285. Thank you. And you gathered the debris into that plastic container? Yes. Do you see anything in it now? Um, in the photograph? No. <laughs> what was done with the debris collected in that Petri dish? Um, I believe Mr. Diedrich um, transferred it to uh, one of his little pillboxes when he returned to the FBI lab. And you see a little pillbox. Actually, you can look down at your monitor if it's more helpful. <laughs> do you see a pillbox with debris in it uh, to the right of that in the photograph? Yes, I do. And is that the pillbox you were referring to that Mr. Diedrich uses? Yes. Now, after you collected the debris into that Petri dish, what did you do with it on August 23rd? Um, well, we repackaged the shirt and returned it to the serology freezer first off. And then we um, took the Petri dish with its contents over to the trace analysis lab. And Mr. Diedrich um, did some examinations of the contents of that Petri dish while I basically stood by. So you actually observed him making the examination at LAPD on that date? Yes. Did he do any mounting at that time? Um, yes, he did. And was, it, was that done in per mount? Uh, yes, it was. Do you see slide mailers in this photograph? Yes, I do. And did he use slide mailers like those? Um, yes. The, the blue one there is one that he used. And the others uh, may have been mounted later. I believe he only mounted one slide on that day. Did you do any mounting? No, I did not. He did it all? Yes. And after he completed his examination of the slide and the, the debris that was collected on August 23rd, what was done with the uh, slide that he created and whatever was remained in the Petri dish? Um, those items were, um, the, the Petri dish itself was sealed up with a piece of tape um, by me, and the Petri dish and the slide were placed in my evidence locker, and then um, I began, uh, well, Mr. Diedrich left. He had um, other business in town that week, and um, two days later, on the 25th, he returned, and I gave him those items after booking them. I wrote out a property report, booked them into our property unit, and then released them to him. So they were, they were in your possession from the time of collection virtually until you gave them to Mr. Diedrich to take back to the FBI? Yes. And when you say you booked them, you just got the barcode on them like before and took them right back? Um, I got the, the barcode on them and, um, let me see. I, I believe we actually had him sign them out or sign them out in some way to release them to him. But you did not leave them in property? No. <coughs> the white envelope that is to the left of the Petri dish and slide mailers, what's that? Um, that's an analyzed evidence envelope. Um, that's what I placed the um, Petri dish and the slide mailer containing the slide into when I booked them into property. And then when you released them to Mr. Diedrich, were they packaged in that envelope? Um, yes, they were, and the envelope was in a sealed condition. I had placed evidence seals on it. Um, the red and white seals you see running 
the length of the package and across the top and the bottom. Now, you examined for us, for me last night, the hair and trace chain of custody board that's been marked people's 436? Yes, I did. You testified yesterday um, to the dates of collection of all of the items, did you not? Yes. Did you make any mistakes in your testimony? No. However, were there some mistakes in the dates that were written on the board? Yes, there were. And you brought those to our attention? Yes. <laughs> so with respect to item number 110, you testified that you collected um, debris from the uh, glove at Rockingham on both June 21st and June 23rd, correct? Yes. And that date has not been added on the board? That's correct. And we will do so, Your Honor. And with respect to 163 to 165, the date of 720 as, is incorrect. And as you testified yesterday, it was July 27th. That's correct. And with respect to 166 to 167, the date of July 20th should be July 28th, correct? That's correct. And for 169, you only collected that evidence on August 2nd, correct? That's correct. Okay, the board will reflect the accurate testimony that you gave. Thank you. Did you also then examine the elimination board that's been marked as people 450, people's 451 at my request? Yes, I did. And for the record, Ron, that is the... Mr. Escobar, you want to give us a hand here? Yeah. That is the uh, eliminated hair samples board. Just, if we can just hold it for a minute. And did you examine all of the I'm information? I'm sorry, counsel, your Mr. Escobar is standing right in front of juror number seven. So I think we need to, why don't we put it up? Okay. Did you examine all the information on that board, Ms. Brockbank? Yes, I did. And is it correct? Um, yes, it is. <laughs> all right, Mr. Blasier. Morning. Um, I take it from your direct testimony that you worked pretty closely with Mr. Dietrich from the FBI. Um, for some of my examinations, yes. And uh, you spent how much time in Washington? Was it two weeks? Yes, it was. And during that time, did you spend most of your time with him while he's conducting his comparisons and analysis? Um, yes, I did. You worked alongside of him? Basically, yes. And when he'd look, some, look at something in the microscope, he'd show you and you'd look at it, correct? Yes. And I think you indicated to Ms. Clark that you agreed with his comparisons and conclusions. Um, yes, I did. Those okay. that he showed me. Now, I want to ask you a couple of general questions about hair and fiber uh, in general. Are there any professional societies that are devoted solely to the examination of hair and trace evidence? Um, societies, I'm not sure. There are several um, groups, um, and I just don't know all of them right offhand, or any of them I can really name for you and be accurate. Are you members of any groups? No, I'm not. When you say groups, what, what kind of groups are they? Um, there's a, a group similar to, I've, I've heard a group for DNA called Twig Dam. There's mm -hmm. one, I think it's called Twig Hair or something. It's <laughs> Um, along the same lines as twig dam, only for hairs and fibers. Do you, uh, and are you any. aware of, of any standards that they've established for hair and fiber analysis? Um, <clears throat> not specifically, no. Now, are there any professional magazines that are devoted to hair and fiber analysis? Um, there are many professional magazines pr uh, devoted specifically just to hair and fiber. I'm not really sure. Uh, would you agree that in the last 50 years there's been uh, very little change in the technology with respect to hair and trace evidence? I've only been involved for the last five years, but um, there has been very little change over the last five years, I can say that much. And there have been some attempts to improve the ability to discriminate with hairs and fibers that really have not been very successful. Yes. 
Uh, it's not certainly the, the amount of resources that have been devoted to hair and fiber are far less than such things as DNA, for instance. Would you agree with that? I would agree, yes. Same thing with, with other forensic areas like serology. There's been a lot more in the way of technological development with those fields than there has been in hair and trace. Yes. Um, are there ever any seminars that are devoted specifically to hair and trace on a regular basis that you know of? Um, there are some. Uh, I, I know Mr. Diedrich mentioned to me that he was going to one a few weeks ago, um, but I, I didn't go myself. And uh, do you, uh, so that's one seminar that you heard about from him. Or do yes. you, have you heard of very many others that are devoted just to that topic? Um, no. Uh, now, would you agree that the reason for that, for the somewhat lack of resources that are devoted to this particular area, is because of the inability to really establish any kind of unique identifications with hair and fiber? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Would you agree that the, the reason why there's not been a whole lot of technological resources put into that area and there's not been a whole lot of development is because of the inability to really uh, establish any kind of unique identifications with trace and hair evidence. That may be the reason, yeah. Now, when you're looking at fibers, you're really only looking for a couple of characteristics of a fiber, correct, usually? Um, you're with uh, most fiber exams, you're, you're um, looking at the fiber to try and identify the type of fiber and usually doing a comparison to, you know, between a known fiber and a questioned fiber. Okay. But you're looking at, like, is it nylon, is it cotton, is it wool? Right. Uh, and with synthetics, you, you may be able to look at other things like, uh, like the cross-sectional shape and the diameter of the surface area, delustrant type things. Um, there are, are many characteristics, yes, that you can look at. Now, with um, things like cotton and wool, you look basically at the type of, type of uh, material it is and the color, correct? Um, yes, those would be two things. And you can also, if you have enough of a fiber, you can do certain kinds of analysis on the dyes in the fiber to try and determine what the chemical composition of the dyes are in the fiber, correct? Yes. And none of that was done in this case, was it? Um, none of that was done by me. I'm not sure what Mr. Diedrich did or didn't do. Okay. Now, when you take a look at uh, one fiber against, a known fiber against an evidence fiber, uh, if those appear to be similar, you, you, you can't from that conclude that they came from the same place, can you? Um, not to my knowledge, short of a, a physical match, where if you have a, like a patch of cloth that's torn out of a piece of clothing where you can physically piece it back in, you would be able to say that that came from that garment. But short of that, I'm not aware of anything where you can definitely say it came from one item. And there's no, we don't have any patches of clothing in this case that you're aware of, do we? Not that I'm aware of. We're, we're basically talking about very small pieces of a, of a thread or a piece of cotton or whatever. Yeah. That wasn't a testimony. Proceed. Now, would you agree that when uh, manufacturers produce fibers, they generally produce them in fairly substantial quantities? Um, I would think so, but I, I don't have any um, particular knowledge in that area. Okay. There are no data banks of fibers that you can go to and see how common or rare a particular fiber is, are there? That I don't know. You're there not may, aware there of it. may be. I'm not aware of it. Well, you do this kind of analysis that, all the time, don't you? Um, w as far as fiber analysis go, my um, analysis has really been limited to just comparing known to questioned fibers, and I haven't really done any research beyond that point as far as frequencies or how often fibers are made or anything of that nature. If there were some data bank available where you could get that information, I'm sure you would have access to it, wouldn't you? Sustain. You're not aware of any such databases that exist with respect to fiber? I'm not aware of one.
Are you aware of any uh, methods available to narrow down the source of a particular fiber if the information you have is what kind of fiber it is, nylon, cotton, whatever, and the color, to, with that piece of inf those two pieces of information to be able to tell who manufactured it? Um, again, that's, that's not something I've ever done, so I'm, I'm not really sure. So you're not aware that, you, that there's any way to do that, are you? I'm not aware, no. Are you aware of any kind of databases that tell you uh, what percentage of the fibers out there in the world fall into a particular category, such as blue-black cotton, 10% of all fibers are going to be blue-black cotton? There's nothing like that, is there? Again, not that I'm aware of. You're not aware, are you, of any technique that allows you, once you know that two fibers are both, let's say, cotton and both are blue-black, to assess some kind of a, a, a numerical description to that to explain what the significance of that is. Um, could you repeat that one more time? Sure. I'm sorry. Do you know of any technique at all that, that's used in your uh, expertise, your specialty, that allows you, once you say, okay, we have an evidence fiber that's cotton blue black and we have a, another fiber that's cotton blue black, to tell you what the significance of the fact is that they look alike? Again, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Now, with hair, when you're looking at hair, collecting hair and looking at it, um, you use various general categories to describe what you're seeing, do you not? Yes. And do you have, a, there's a form that you use when you do, uh, when you look at a hair and you, you write down the things that you observe about it that's kind of like a chart that's broken down into categories, correct? Yes. You have one of those with you? A blank one? Um, probably not a blank one. Ms. Bronkbank, let me show you uh, Defense Exhibit 1217. Is this the worksheet that you use uh, when you're looking at here? Yes, it is. And that one, uh, that one is the worksheet that you used for item number 58, correct? Yes. Um, now, you didn't observe <laughs> any human hairs in 58, so it's, it's blank, correct? Yes. But that shows the categories that you use. Yes, it does. Can we put this on the Elmo, please? zoom in on the column on the left categories a little bit. Now, could we move it up so that the curl, you can see curl a little better? This is an example of some of the characteristics that uh, you use to describe what you see when you look at a hair, correct? Yes. And taking, for example, the curl category, it's only broken down into three different subgroups, right? Um, as far as, as this form goes, the things that are listed 
in that area, um, using curl, you, you see tight, loose, or none. They're general descriptions that you can use, but it, it's not limited just to that. Okay, so uh, you have three categories on your form, but there could be others that you might use. Yes. Uh, is that true with the other categories on there? Yes. Would you agree that these categories are, are very subjective in the sense that it's what you see, and, and you use a word to describe what you see that you feel comfortable with, correct? Yes. Uh, this particular form is not uh, some sort of an industry standard form, is it? Not at all. There's no standardization at all, is there, in the uh, area of hair analysis in terms of specific descriptions that you give to specific characteristics? Um, I have seen guidelines um, for, you know, terminology to be used, um, but there is no hard and fast rule that you must use a certain terminology. So each examiner can choose pretty much what they feel comfortable with in terms of describing characteristics? Pretty much. Uh, and a lot of these characteristics are uh, somewhat general in nature, are they not? Um, yes, some of them are general. In other words, something that you might describe as a heavy curl, someone else might say, ah, it's just a medium curl or a light curl. Yes. So with this kind of analysis, with hair analysis, there's, you don't have the uh, ability to, well, let me rephrase that. Different examiners use different terminology and different characteristics, don't they? Yes. Um, so if you describe, if you list eight or ten things that you've observed on a particular hair and that hair is given to somebody else, they might have different descriptions for the same hair. Yes, they might. So there's no way for you to just provide a description to some other examiner someplace and, there, and, and have them have the ability to compare using just your description, that description with some other hair. That would not be a real good idea, no. Okay. <laughs> now, with hair analysis and fiber analysis, do you undergo any kinds of blind external proficiency testing? Um, we don't go under any blind testing. We do have proficiency tests, but they're not blind. Okay. We, know, they're, we know that we're being tested. Now, when you do those proficiency tests, is it, the, is it the same kind of comparison that you do in casework, namely that you're only comparing two things, a known sample with an evidence sample? Um, no, not really. You, what, what does it usually entail? Um, for our, our fiber uh, proficiency tests that we get, sometimes you're comparing, you know, two or three different items to each other. So you may not just have one and one. Okay. Um, and as far as our hair proficiency tests, we usually have um, uh, like ten known hairs that we're comparing to a questioned hair. So there are several comparisons that you actually do, not just a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Is, uh, is ten pretty much the limit in terms of the number of questioned hairs that you ever might examine at one time to compare with a known hair? Um, there's no limit. Um, it's, you know, as far as casework goes, it's a case-by-case -case basis. You can examine many, you know, many, many questioned hairs compared to one known standard or vice versa. You know, have one questioned hair compared to many known standards, but there's no, no limit on the number you might encounter. Okay. Do you keep any kind of records that allows you to compare a hair that you're looking at in one case with something that you might have looked at a year ago? Um, other than these hair worksheets that I fill out, that, that's my written record. Um, but again, you don't perform a hair comparison on paper. You need to do a visual comparison. So you really don't, just because of the nature of this kind of analysis, you don't have the ability to say, gee, I saw hair like that two years ago in a case and then go get that case. If you had a memory that good, you could go get that case and then examine the hair side by side. You don't, do you? Uh, not generally, no. Okay. I mean, it's not like um, um, fingerprints, for instance, where you, you, there's a uniform way to characterize fingerprints and there's computers that have everybody's fingerprints in them that have been fingerprinted and you can go off and say, have you ever seen this print before? No, it's not like that. No such system like that? No. Are there any databases at all that uh, allow you to look at a particular characteristic in a hair and tell you how common or rare it is? I don't believe so. Uh, 
Uh, now, with hairs, you indicated that when you collect an exemplar, you collect a representative sample from all over the head. That's correct. And that's because in one head, you're going to have different kinds of hairs. Correct. It's not, there's no uniformity, no uniqueness, one hair to the other in a single person. Well, you generally do see a lot of similarities. But there may be a lot of differences. Um, but there may be a, there's usually a range of all of those characteristics that you observe. There, you'll usually see a range. You don't see just one, you know, carbon copy on every hair. It's just not how it is. I mean, it's not like DNA where every cell in the body has the same DNA. Correct. It's not like that. I mean, this, this technology, we're not counting molecules here. We're looking at very general things, aren't we? Sustain. Rephrase the question. Uh, we're not doing any kind of molecular analysis with hair and fiber analysis. We're looking at fairly general categories, correct? Yes. Oh, well. Would a good analogy uh, for hair analysis be that it's like looking at a leaf and trying to match it up to a specific tree in the sense that a particular tree might have different kinds of or leaves that look a little different. Sustain. Do you understand the analogy of, of picking up a leaf from the ground and trying to match it to a tree? Oh, well. Um, yes, I understand that. And like a leaf, you. Uh, just you wouldn't, you know, you could look at one leaf on a tree and it may not look the same, but it still might come from that same tree. If you picked up a leaf and it didn't look like the leaves on a tree, I wouldn't think it came from that tree. No, no I mean, not exact. I mean, let's say it's an oak leaf, but it just doesn't look exactly like the one you happen to pick from the tree. It still could have come from that tree and just have a slightly different look. Sustain. Now, I want to ask you about uh, exclusions with hair analysis. You're familiar with, uh, you've done some conventional serology work in your past, have you not? No, I have not. OK. Well, you're, you're generally familiar with some of the things that are done in conventional serology. Generally familiar, yes. And if you have, if you're doing genetic marker testing and you find a genetic marker in your evidence that's different from you're known, you, can, you know you've got an exclusion. Sustain. Now, with hair analysis, you can't necessarily, uh, if you see one hair that looks, has some different characteristics from another hair, that doesn't necessarily mean they're excluded, does it? Sustain. Let's raise the question. If you have an evidence hair and it doesn't look exactly like a suspect hair, or, or a known hair, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't come from the same source, does it? Well, the point of doing a, a hair comparison is looking at a known sample, getting an idea of the range of characteristics in that known sample, and then comparing that question hair to it. If, if the question hair is different, then you can't exclude it from coming from that source. Well, let me, let me ask it a different way. If you take an exemplar from somebody and, and you only take a couple of hairs from one part of the head and you have an evidence hair and it doesn't look identical, that doesn't necessarily mean it didn't come from that person just from a different part of the head. Objection to the relevant hypothetical also assumes back evidence. Am I accurate? Um, if, if your exemplar that you're dealing with is not an adequate exemplar, then I would agree, yes. Okay. Um, so if you don't have enough exemplar to make up your known sample, even, even a, what, what might be an exclusion or might appear to be an exclusion can be somewhat equivocal as well if you don't have enough known sample to compare it to. Um, that would be correct. Okay. Now, with respect to the exemplar that you took from Mr. Simpson, 
Uh, you counted and you'd taken 93 hairs. Yes. Have you taken exemplars from suspects in other cases? Yes, I have. Uh, do you always take in the area of 90 to 100 hairs when you take an exemplar from somebody? Um, I usually try to get a minimum of 30, um, and I generally don't count them because I, under this, in this case, the reason I counted them because was because I was working under a court order while I, where I was given a ceiling okay. number of 100 hairs. But I generally don't count, but I usually attempt to get at least 30. All right, so the, the number that you got here was three times more than what you normally attempt to get. Phrase the question. Uh, you normally try to get 30 hairs. At, a minimum. Least, at least 30. Yes. You got 90 hairs, so you got three times your minimum. Yes. Now, when you collect exemplar hairs, um, you convert those into slides so that you can do comparisons, correct? Yes. And did you do that with Mr. Simpson's hair? Um, I did mount some of his hairs when I was back at the FBI lab. And did Mr. Diedrich mount some also? your knowledge? Yes, I think he did mount some additional hairs. How many slides uh, were made, exemplar slides, from Mr. Simpson? I don't know. Do you have that information oh. in your record? Um, I may have some. Let me just check. <coughs> Um, I, I mounted five slides, each with five hairs on them. And then I believe Mr. Diedrich mounted additional hairs. Do you know how many slides he mounted? No, I don't. Now, the exemplars that you took from the uh, various police officers, uh, approximately how many hairs did you take from them? Again, I was attempting to get a minimum of 30. So you did not take as many hairs, or did you take as many hairs from the police officers as you took from Mr. Simpson? Um, I didn't count them. How many so. slides did you make of the exemplars for the police officers for comparison purposes? I made none. How many did Mr. Dietrich make? I don't know. Is, uh, do you generally put the same number of hairs on a slide as Mr. Dietrich does? No. I think you indicated yesterday that you do one to five and he does several. Yes. I'm not sure what the difference is. What's well, the um, I, I do generally put one to five um, hairs on a slide, and when I mount that slide, I actually um, use a system to where I can identify each single hair on that slide based on a numbering system. Um, the slide, I give a number. For instance, the first slide I mount would be number one, and then I would have a lettering system, A through E, if I have five, five hairs on that slide. Starting from the end of the slide, you have A, B, C, D, E. So I spaced them out on the slide. Um, Mr. Diedrich, um, I believe, mounts hairs many, several, many. <laughs> I don't know the right terminology, but to a slide. And some of those hairs may be overlapping and such on the slide. He doesn't specifically number every hair that's on that slide like I do. So the slides that you make, you have the ability, once you have done the work, to actually look at an individual hair by itself, not obscured or covered over or overlapped by another hair, correct? There may be a little overlap, but you can tell which hair you're, you're talking about. And you, um, you provide some sort of letter identification so that if you look at hair C from that slide today and, and make some sort of comparison or observations, you can come back six months from now or a year from now and pick out the specific hair you were thinking of and you were looking at when you made those notes, can't you? Yes. Can't do that with Mr. Dietrich's slides, can you? Um, I probably couldn't. I'm sorry. D 
does it, is a lot more time consuming to make slides that way? Yes. That's the proper way to do it, isn't it? Um, I don't know if there is a proper and improper way of mounting slides. That's the way that I was taught to mount slides at LAPD. Okay. Now, you, you prepared five slides, exemplar slides of Mr. Simpson, and Mr. Dietrich prepared some additional slides, correct? Yes. Uh, did you feel it was necessary to have five slides uh, to give you a representative sampling of Mr. Simpson's hair for comparison purposes? Um, actually, Mr. Dietrich asked me to... Um, mount 25 hairs, which is what I did. <laughs> okay. And uh, you felt it was necessary to have that many slides or that many hairs for a proper comparison? Um, not necessarily. In the past, I have mounted as few as 8 to 10 hairs for a comparison. So um, 25 is a reasonable number to mount. Okay. Depending on the variation you see in a person's hair, you may want to mount, you know, up to 100 hairs. Um, if there's not a lot of variation, you can mount as few as eight. And the more that you use, for example, our purposes, the better your ability to make an unequivocal statement that we have an exclusion or we have a similarity. Because you've got, I'm sorry, because you've got a good representative of a person's head hair. Right, I would agree with that. And uh, would you agree that the fewer number of hairs that you have on a slide, the less your ability to make an unequivocal statement about exclusion or inclusion? Um, the fewer hairs you have in an exemplar? Yeah. I would agree, yes. Would you ever use using the, the, the procedures that you've been trained to use, only two slides uh, for an exemplar for comparison purposes from a single individual. Counsel, that, that question's vague because we don't know how many hairs are in each slide. Well, well, let me ask you about that then. The number of hairs in the slide, obviously, well, let me ask you. If you have a lot of hairs on one slide, that hampers your ability to really uh, make a, an individual analysis of each individual hair, doesn't it? question. For you, if you're looking at a slide that has a whole bunch of hairs in one slide that may be overlapped and not marked, that hampers your ability to do a very specific comparison or analysis of each individual hair, doesn't it? A whole bunch doesn't help us a lot. Let me see counsel sidebar with the court report, please. Thank you, Council. Proceed. Uh, Ms. Bronkrank, uh, I note from your CV that you also have provided training um, in field investigations for 
hair and trace analysis or collection of hair and trace evidence? Um, for other criminalists? Yes. Yes. Um, is that at LAPD? Yes. Incidentally, were, were your primary training and, and learning the techniques that you've described how you do this kind of analysis, did you obtain that, at, get that at LAPD or someplace else? At LAPD. Did you receive any training at the Orange County Crime Lab? No. Okay. Now, I think you described that the trace unit at LAPD is in its own little separate room. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, and how big is that room? Um, maybe about a quarter of the size of this courtroom. And is that your is that room used by you uh, just for hair and trace analysis, or are there other kinds of different analysis going on in that room at the same time? Well, as far as our trace unit, um, as I mentioned earlier, we perform several types of analysis: hair and fibers, shoe prints, tire tracks, tool marks, paint, glass. So quite a variety that of different types of analysis do go on there, not just hair and fiber. Um, okay. Now, are, is that room, um, is there a fan in that room? Um, not a fan. We do have an air conditioning system. Okay. Now, it's one of the things that you're trying to, to be careful of when you're doing collections of hairs and fibers is not to have a lot of w air currents going on in the room, right? Yes. Because this stuff is very volatile and can get blown from one place to another if you're not careful, can't it? Um, if you're not careful, yes, it could. Um, and do you try to take precautions to make sure that there aren't a lot of people walking around in the room with maybe lab coats that are flapping on and off or whatever to limit the amount of air currents that might be in the room? Um, there generally aren't a lot of people walking around, and I, I don't know that walking around creates tremendous air currents, though. You wouldn't recommend, though, as a procedure, uh, that you conduct this kind of uh, analysis and collection in a room with a lot of people in it doing other things, would you? Um, if, if they're doing things where they're just sitting in one place, I don't think that would really matter. If, if they're walking by briskly and, you know, um, you're working in a crowded situation, I would say no. Now, hair and trace evidence is, uh, <coughs> many times, difficult to see just with the naked eye looking at a distance, is it not? Um, looking at a distance, yes. If you were looking at a, a hat or a glove on the ground, for instance, uh, and you were standing up, it'd be very difficult for you to identify any uh, hair and fiber evidence on that article, wouldn't it? You may be able to see it, but... You may not. I mean, the, the, when you remove hairs, for instance, from the cap, you do a very careful analysis and you roll it very carefully and you look at it very closely in order to see these things, correct? Yes. And you see things when you do that that you can't see with a naked eye unless you're specifically looking for them. That could be correct, yes. And you have to be very careful because uh, items such as this can get dislodged uh, fairly easily and just fall off, can't they? Um, it, it probably has a lot to do with whatever it's on. You know, if, if you're talking about hairs and fibers on some smooth surface, it would be very easy, I think, for those to get dislodged if that moved around. Um, clothing items, depending on the weave of the clothing, may hold those fibers a little more strenuously you know, and so moving it around a little, they might not fall off. It just really depends. Okay, and there's no real um, data that tells you if, with a particular fabric how well that holds a foreign fiber and, or not, do, is there? Not that I'm aware of. And you can, if you, if you brush, if I brushed my coat on something that had some hair on it, that hair could get transferred to my coat pretty easily, couldn't it? Um, that would be possible, yes. And then if I touch something else, it could go to somebody else or some other place and get transferred over and over and over again, correct? That could be possible, yes. And one of the limitations of this kind of analysis is that you have no way of telling when you see something, 
a hair or a fiber on an object, how many different levels of transfer it has gone through from its original source. You would have no way of knowing that just by looking at, at a fiber on a, on a surface now. And hair and fiber is, uh, they're both very stable in the sense that they don't break down real quickly. Correct? That's, that's correct. So if your hair, if you have a hair that falls in the ground, it's going to stay a hair for a long time. Yes, it will. So you have no way of looking at a hair or a fiber and telling from the appearance how long it's been since that was on its original source. Well, sometimes when you're, when you're looking at a hair or a fiber, you do see things um, that might indicate it's been there a while, um, like dirt accumulated on the fiber itself, or um, in the case of a hair that's been there for a while, it might actually have like bite marks on it where some insect activity has occurred. Um, and um, that is something that I've seen from time to time um, in evidence from crime scenes. So that might be one indication that if you see a hair with bite marks on it, that that's an indication it's probably been there for a while, maybe. Yeah, most people don't walk around with hair on their head that insects are chewing on, so. Now, in your lab, you are very careful not to have two items of evidence out at the same time, unless it's absolutely necessary, correct? Um, that would be correct unless you're, you know, performing a comparison between those two items and you need to see them at the same time. And the reason for not having them out together is because of the volatility of this kind of evidence. You want to make sure that you don't have something move from one object to the other. That's correct. Now, when evidence is at a crime scene, lying on the ground, for instance, um, for a long period of time, there's no way to protect those individual pieces of evidence to prevent transfers of hair and fiber evidence from one to the other, is there? Um, there's no way to protect those items, no. I mean, anything you did to protect those would probably create more of a problem. And there's no way to... Uh, prevent, let's say hypothetically that you have some detectives at a crime scene and they're walking around, they're looking at things. If they have th hairs and fibers that have transferred to their clothing, there's no way to protect the evidence from those things falling off clothing and landing on the ground or on an evidence object, is there? Oh. Um. I don't think there's a way to prevent that, but then again, I don't know how often, you know, people are just dropping hairs and fibers, um, or if, you know, it takes some sort of actual contact to transfer fibers. So there's no data that you're aware of or studies that you're aware of that, that measure that in terms of how easily hair and fiber can be transferred from one person to another, one object to another? There may be some studies, um, but I, I'm not specifically aware of any. Now, people lose generally 100 hairs a day, don't they? I have read that, yes. So over a 30-day period, each person loses maybe 3,000 hairs roughly? <laughs> yes. It's a lot of hairs, isn't it? Yes, it is. And would you agree that a person's natural environment where they spend time is likely to have hairs that have fallen out of their heads? I know mine does, yes. <laughs> now, let me ask you hypothetically if several police officers, several detectives spent some time at Mr. Simpson's home in an area where he spends a lot of time, perhaps sitting on furniture or whatever, moving around, it's possible that they can pick up trace evidence that might be at that location on their clothing without knowing it. That would be a possibility. And if they then go back to Bundy, to the crime scene, before any, anything's been collected, there's the possibility that things that they might have picked up at Rockingham can be transferred to Bundy. That could be possible. Is one of the reasons why you try to process a crime scene quickly to get the evidence preserved as quickly as possible is to prevent those kinds of cross transfers and, and compromise of the evidence? Yes. It's one of the reasons why you 
might want to wear protective footwear at a crime scene is to prevent your transferring or your depositing fiber evidence or hair evidence that might be on your shoes or on your in the cuffs of your pants. Um, that may be one reason to uh, wear protective footwear. Um, usually when we wear that, it's uh, to prevent transfer of, of blood. If, if there's a particularly bloody crime scene to us, um, a lot of the protective wear that we use, gloves, lab coats, protective footwear, disposable jumpsuits are more of a protection for us as far as, as dealing with you know, blood contaminated evidence. Um, but it also works the opposite way to protect the evidence from us contaminating it. For instance, if you uh, had been in, in your car and picked up some carpet fibers in your shoes, putting on protective footwear would prevent those fibers from getting deposited where you walk, wouldn't it? Yes. Would you agree that it would be improper procedure you know, at a crime scene to bring something into the crime scene, such as a blanket, which might have trace evidence already on it, and hence expose the evidence to whatever might have been on a blanket? Um, that's not something. That's not something I would recommend doing. Okay. Now, would you agree that you also would not recommend taking something like a blanket or a large object and splaying it out or putting it down in a way that causes air currents that might move other things around in the crime scene? Objections call for speculation. Seems that's not necessary. Sustain. Would you agree that in order to preserve a crime scene, uh, at least as to trace and fiber evidence, you want to be careful not to do anything, anything that creates air currents that might move the evidence around? Yes, I would try to do and, that. I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't want to do anything that promoted that. And would you also, uh, in order to preserve the integrity of any hair and trace evidence that might be at a crime scene, uh, avoid moving one object across another object, well, let me, let me be more specific, dragging a body across pieces of evidence. You wouldn't want to do that, would you? No, I would not. You would not want to move pieces of physical evidence from one place to another before they're collected, would you? Um, when I'm collecting evidence at crime scenes, I, I do not move evidence until I collect it. Okay. If you pick something up, did something with it, just held it or whatever, and then put it down at a different place, that might compromise the integrity of any trace evidence on that item, wouldn't it? It might, yes. And moving things across dirt, for instance, might cause, that movement alone might cause the object to pick up hair or fiber that's in the dirt. That could be a possibility. Would you agree that if there are two different environments, two different locations where a person spends time, that it's likely that you might find a trace evidence of that person at both of those locations? Sustain. If you have, let's, let's hypothetically, this, if you this, have a person who spends exceeds, a lot of time. This exceeds I'm, I'm the sorry? scope of the direct examination council. Do you know whether there are any studies that uh, look into whether dogs in, in their fur can transfer trace evidence from one place to another? Um, there may be studies, but I'm not aware personally of them. Uh, do you know whether or not dogs or animals lose hairs faster than people do? Again, I don't know the, the right animals lose hairs. Would you agree that you would not, it would not be unusual to find an abundance of a dog, of dog hairs 
consistent with a dog that frequents a particular area. I would not find that unusual. The notes that you have prepared, or that you prepare when you do your work, you do those contemporaneously with the work that you do, correct? Yes. And they're all done in uh, chronological sequence and describe in, in fairly great detail what you do from one step to the next. Usually. And that's the procedure that you've been taught as the proper procedure? Yes. Um, do you ever, if you, if you do something on an item of evidence that you've already done something on before, do you ever just go back to your old notes and just kind of make a notation that you've done something else to it, or do you create a whole new note in sequence so that you can reconstruct exactly what you've done from start to finish? Um, I usually make um, you know, new notes, just continuing on where I left off. Um, in this case, on uh, I believe the little glove diagrams that I made, I did add some additional notes to them, and I made a note of that in sequence that I did add additional notes to it. So, so even uh, when you do that, you can, you can tell what you did. Right. And you don't have to rely on your memory to remember what you did. You can look at your own paperwork a year, two years from now, and this is what I did. Right. Now, you told us in uh, a lot of detail about how you change your gloves between every single item that you look at. Yes, I do. And that's the proper procedure that you've been taught, is it not? Yes. And you change paper between every single item that you look at, don't you? Yes, I do. And that's good procedure, isn't it? I believe so. And that's because even though you look at the paper, you may miss something. In other, let me be more detailed. After you're done looking at an item, you okay. examine the paper to see if there's any trace evidence there. If you okay. see trace evidence, you try and put it back in the container. Correct. You don't see trace evidence, you don't just leave the paper there, you get rid of the paper, don't you? Yes. And that's because some of this stuff you may not, you may just miss. There, there may be something there, very tiny, that you might miss. Um, there also may be biological contamination, you know, as far, because a lot of the, the evidence we deal with is bloody evidence, and so you don't want that around for the next item, so you just want to make sure you've got a clean working surface. And you're careful to have a lab coat on at all times? Yes. And that's to prevent things from your clothing getting into the evidence, isn't it? Um, that and also to prevent things that I'm working with to get on me. Now, do you uh, use a new lab coat each day? Um, no. How frequently do you change? Um, I wear the same lab coat um, most of the time. It's laundered weekly. And, um, you know, if I, if I was to get something on it, then I would launder it, you know, immediately. Um, I do have two lab coats that I, that I can uh, alternate. alternate on if I need to. Uh, Mr. Didrick didn't wear a lab coat? I don't believe so. Did he change gloves between every single item? Um, Objection. Sustain, between every single evidence item that he examined in your presence, did he change gloves? Yes, he did. Did he change paper on the table between every evidence item that he examined in your presence? Um, we were doing this together, so I don't know if he changed paper or I changed paper, but paper would have been changed, yes. Okay.
Now, you testified on direct that you saw there were some of the hairs that you examined had what appeared to be blood on them. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, I do. You have no way of telling from looking at a hair that appears to have blood on it when the blood got on the hair, do you? No. You have no way of telling whether the blood was on an object and then the hair got on it or the hair was on the object and then the blood got on it, do you? No. And you have no way of telling whether the hair and the blood got together before they got on the object either, do you? No. Now, you talked about the difference between water mounts and per mounts yesterday. You remember that? Yes. Now, water mounts, I think you said, was not the desirable procedure. No. Okay. What would you say about that? Um, that, that may have been what I said. Okay. I, it, it is not the desirable procedure. And the reason for that is because it affects your ability to uh, look at colors, doesn't it? To look at most characteristics of the hair, color being one of them. It doesn't prevent you from counting hairs, does it? Well, it could if um, two hairs happen to be, you know, crossing over very close to each other because of that, uh, you know, difference, the dark black line I told you about, um, you may actually obscure a couple hairs. Um, when you counted the hairs in this case on the wet mounts, were you pretty careful about, were you very careful about counting the number of hairs? I tried to be careful. And you take your time and you count everything that's there that you see? Yes. And you indicated that some of the slides that you mounted and counted and recorded the number of hairs, uh, when they got to Washington, more hairs were found on those slides, correct? Well, they were just um, water mounted by me. So hairs weren't found on the slides, but in the bindles. So after you, after you look at it on the water mount, you take it off that and put it in the bindle. That's correct. And you're careful to make sure that you don't add anything to the bindle. That's correct. When you do that. Yes. And when those bindles got to Washington, some of them had more hairs in them. Than I had counted, yes. Do you have, uh, you were asked to look at the property reports yesterday to tell us what the description was for the blood stain items that you also looked at in either box number one or box number two. Do you remember that? Yes. You have those property reports with you? No. <laughs> uh, you were asked to, to tell us what the description was, and you said that the descriptions were swatch or swatches. Remember saying that? Yes. Almost every one of those descriptions in the property report was singular, swatch, swatch. wasn't it? It's big. How many of the, the items that Ms. Clark read to you while we were standing up there <coughs> uh, referred to anything other than swatch singular? Sustain. <coughs> and what time are we going to break? About four or five minutes. Ten thirty. You indicated yesterday that you put, at one point, you put both gloves on the floor to do a comparison photograph. Yes. And uh, they were on separate pieces of paper? Yes, they were. You positive about that? Yes. Could we have exhibit 444, please?
Is that a, a picture of the comparison that you did on the floor? Yes. Uh, do you see any seam showing individual pieces of paper between the gloves? I do not see a seam. Do you have any other picture that shows that, uh, that shows a seam? Um, I don't. Let me go back for a minute to your hair description chart. Go back down a little bit. And there's 12. 12, 17. Thank you. I want to ask you just one more question about hair analysis. Is there any standard in the, uh, in the field of hair analysis for what characteristics have to be present to say that two things are consistent? Not that I'm aware of. So one examiner may have different criteria in terms of what specific characteristics or the number of characteristics that they require before they say something is consistent than another examiner. That may be correct. You referred to uh, at one point that, that people or somebody was sent back to Mr. Goldman's apartment to get an exemplar from a hairbrush. Remember that? Yes. That's a fairly common uh, procedure if you need extra hairs from uh, uh, extra exemplar to get them from a person's hairbrush, isn't it? Um, it's something I, I personally had never done before, but I understand that it is done. And you would expect to find a person's hair in their hairbrush? I would. Um, if, if someone had access to, for instance, the defendant's hairbrush, they could get exemplars, uh, probably a substantial number, from his hairbrush, couldn't they? I would imagine so, yes. Or perhaps it might be a good time. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, mid morning break at this time. Please remember all of my admonitions to you, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Ms. Brockbank, come back in 15 minutes. All right. Thank you. All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, all parties are again present. We also have present with us Deputy District Attorney William Hodgman. Morning, Mr. Hodgman. How hey, are you Good today? morning, Your Honor. Do you have some word for us? Well, I have some words in the sense that I have a request. There are certain things going on, Your Honor, that, that I'm supervising and coordinating at the moment. Um, I was going to ask the court for tomorrow morning because we should have these things resolved by tomorrow morning. They're very late breaking and they, the investigative efforts will be determinative. Come on up here.
Thank you, Council. All right, Deputy Magnar, let's have the jurors, please. All right, Ms. Brockbank, would you uh, resume the witness stand, please? And the record should reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. All right, Mr. Blazier. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Brockbank, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Brockbank, I'd like to ask you some questions about the carpet sample. That's item number 33, is it not? Yes. Now, how large a sample was that, or is it? Um, I didn't measure it, but it's um, probably two to three feet long and a foot and a half to two feet across. It's, it's a somewhat large and bulky item, is it not? Yes. You can't put it in an envelope? No. Um, would it be fair to say that it probably has thousands and thousands of fibers in it from the Bronco? I would imagine so, yes. Now, did you take note, uh, when you ultimately examined it, did you take note of the edges of where it was cut in terms of how much of the circumference around it was carpet as opposed to rubber matting? You know what I'm, I'm um, I know what you're asking, and I believe all of it was. Was carpet? I believe so. And did you make any note of what kind of cutting device was used on the carpeting to see how rough or smooth the edge was? No. Uh, is it your experience in working with fiber evidence that uh, fibers from a carpet like that come off? Yes. And particularly if you cut along an edge of a carpet like that, it, it tends to cause things along the edges to fall off too, doesn't it? Yes. Now that item was too big to be stored in a bag, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So it was stored, the first time you saw it, it was wrapped up in a piece of paper. That's correct. And it was in box number two, right? Yes, I believe so. You want to double check that? Yes, if I could. Yes, it was in what I designated box number two. And when you first saw that, it was June 21st, was it not? Yes. Did you get box number two from the evidence uh, control unit? Yes, I did. And you took it in, where did you take it first? Into the trace unit. You opened the box and this large thing in paper was there. Yes. And it was there in the same box as several other evidence items, correct? Yes. Was it your intent at that time to examine the carpet? Um, not at that time, no. What was your purpose in opening box number two at that time? Um, to examine the, um, the two gloves and the two hats that were also in that box. Had you begin, been given some instructions to examine just those items and no other items? Yes. 
So you did not conduct a, a close inspection of the carpet or the container that it was wrapped in, did you? Um, other than to know it was paper wrapped and, and sealed and no. Well, when you say sealed, did you examine it carefully to determine that every seam in the paper that might lead to the inside was covered with tape? Not every seam. I mean, it, it was closed with tape. Um, there were no, you know, large gaps. I couldn't see any carpet sticking out of any orifices. But you didn't carefully check each possible opening in the seam, did you, for tape? Inch by inch, no. Okay. Did you even know it was a carpet in there? Um, at that time, no. So you had no knowledge at that time that you might be comparing fibers from that object with evidence items that were contained in the same box, did you? No, I did not. Now that carpet fiber, you've seen individual fibers from the Bronco carpet, haven't you? Um, since that time, yes. And the ones you've seen are tan nylon car tan nylon tan nylon fibers, correct? I believe so, yes. The color also described is rose beige as well, same same color? Yes. Now that box that contained the carpet wrapped up in paper was the same box that contained the Rockingham glove in a, in a paper bag, correct? Yes. It was the same bag, the same box, excuse me, that contained the knit cap. Yes. Same bag that contained the Bundy glove. I'm sorry, same box that contained the Bundy glove. Yes. How was the paper folded that contained the carpet? Or, or did you even notice that? Um, at that time, no, not really. Did you actually take the packet of carpet outside of the box on that, that time? Um, no, I didn't. So it was left inside the box? Yes, it was. Did you ever take it out during that particular examination on the 21st? No. So is it fair to say that you did not conduct a careful examination of the inside of the box to see whether there might be any carpet fibers that have gotten out of the package in, or under the package in, in the corners of the box? Um, no, I did not. Was the first thing that you did after you opened that box was to look at the Rockingham glove? The first thing I did after opening the box? I did believe um, I, I examined the hats first and then the gloves. Now, did you examine the Rockingham glove first? Or um, the Bundy glove be, first? Or do item you number nine, I yeah. believe I examined first, yes. Now, when you looked at the uh, Rockingham glove, it was in a bag, correct? Yes. You opened the bag. Did you take out the glove before you looked in the bag? Yes. Well, I no. I mean, I open the bag, I look in the bag, I see the glove, so I take the glove out. Okay. So you take the glove out. Then did you examine the glove or did you examine the bag? Or do you remember? Well, I took the glove out, laid it on my piece of paper, and then I, I look in the bag again. And when you looked in the bag, you saw some debris? Yes. Could you tell when you looked in the bag before you emptied it whether there was a tan carpet fiber in the debris in the bag? No. When you emptied out the bag, uh, I, can I assume that you held it with one hand and had the other hand out like, like I'm doing and, and dumped the bag out into your hand? Um, no. How did you do it? Um, I held the bag with, with one hand and I... Um, it reached in with the other and, and got what I could see and kind of tapped the bag over a piece, a piece of paper. So in addition to reaching in and removing something, you tapped the bag so that anything that might be on the bag would go on the paper? Yes. Uh, did you note whether once everything was on the paper, did you see a tan carpet fiber or tan fiber? No. You have no way of knowing if there was a tan fiber in there, whether it came from the inside or the outside of the glove bag, do you? 
No. You wouldn't, would, would you agree that it is not an appropriate procedure, had you known, to store that large piece of carpet in the same box with evidence items from which you're going to ultimately do some comparison? Um, as far as that fiber evidence? Yes. Um, if, it probably would not be my first choice. Okay. You'd want to keep those separate before you do any kind of comparison be to prevent the possibility that they got cross-contaminated without you knowing about it. That's correct. Now, paper bags, a lot of times with this kind of evidence are used because they're porous and they allow uh, air to go through to dry things. Is that one reason why paper bags are used? Yes. But paper bags have a lot of little seams and creases in them on the inside and the outside that can catch things, don't they? Um, where the bottom's kind of glued shut, I guess there are some, some creases there, yes. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why Rather than just looking in and reaching in and getting debris, you turn it over and you tap it to make sure that things that might have adhered to either the outside or the inside fall off. Well, what I'm trying to get is the stuff from the inside, but there may inadvertently be something on the outside. The sample, the debris that was on the paper after you turned the bag over from the Rockingham glove, uh, did you assign that a number? Um, that was uh, all part of item number 110. And item number 110 was all of the things that you had removed, all the debris that you had removed from that particular glove over the various times that you looked at it. Yes. That particular bindle, when you went to Washington, that was one of the ones that you took with you, was it not? Yes, it was. And was that opened by uh, Mr. Dietrich in your presence? Or yes. opened by you in his presence? Opened by him in my presence. And he marked each of the bindles that you had prepared from not only that item but other items were marked right at that time when they were opened. Yes, they were. What was the marking given, what was the number given to that particular bindle? That is the one, the debris from the Rockingham glove bag that you turned over and tapped. It was given a Q number, and I, I don't know it off the top of my head, and I didn't record it in my notes. Uh, would it be on the picture there? Would you be able to see it um, from the picture? Probably. Maybe we can put this down so she can look at it closely. See item 110 over on uh, people's number 443? 436. Can I get up? Sure. Second one down from the right, on the right from the top. Yes. Now, FBI number is indicated as Q3A, B, and C. Is that consistent with your recollection? Again, I didn't make any note of it. According to the chart, that's the number he assigned. Can you look at the picture? Each window was marked uh, Q3A, B, or C, was it not? Yes. In your presence? Yes. Can you see that picture closely enough to tell what the marking was on the debris from the bag from the Rockingham Club? The descriptions of the bindles are actually on the other side of the bindles, okay. so I can't really tell you. Um, they are marked Q3, A, B, and C, but I don't know which one's A, which one's B, which one's C. Okay. Okay. Now, Ms. Clark, check we can stipulate to that. Now you, on t was it two other occasions that you examined that particular glove and 
remove debris from the glove? On one other occasion. One other occasion, and that was what date? On um, June 23rd. Let me, uh, I have a picture of, of what's on the board. Is this photograph been marked? Mr. No, this is from the, it's a photograph from the board. Right. It's the uh, second. It's as to item which? As to item number 110. All right, thank you. That'll identify the photograph. prepared to stipulate that that debris item is Q3C and we'll double check just to make sure but all right okay all right thank you council now the debris that was in that bag uh, or that wound up on the paper on the on the table you have no way of knowing when that or if it even came off of the glove do you Um, the glove is the only item that was in that bag, so I would feel fairly certain that it did come off that glove, yes. But you have no idea when, do you? When it came off the glove? Sometime after or during the process of putting it in the bag, I would guess. Okay, but you, the procedure that's used at SID, uh, well, let me, let me withdraw that. Your procedure is that when you remove debris from an evidence item, you put it in a separate bindle rather than just putting it back in the bag with the original item, correct? Yes. And do you also do that if you are examining an item like you did with the Rockingham glove and find debris in the bag? You preserve that in a separate bindle, marked, dated, initialed, so that you can go back and reconstruct when that debris got there, don't you? Yes. Now, when you're examining an item and, and debris winds up on your paper, sometimes you just pour it back in the bag rather than putting it in a separate bindle, correct? Um, I don't follow you. Could you? I, I think you described uh, sometimes, for instance, I think when you were examining the shirt or maybe some of the other clothing items where you put them on the paper to examine them, put them back in their bag, and if you see any debris on the paper, you fold a crease in the bottom of it and pour it back in the bag. No, I don't believe I testified to that. Okay. When that happens, what do you do with what you find on the paper? I would place it in a bindle and that's, mark, so mark it. Okay. And that's the proper procedure anytime something falls off of an item. That's what I would do, yes. When you examined the Rockingham glove after preserving the debris in the bag, did you ever see a tan carpet fiber from the glove? I may have seen a tan carpet fiber, but not recognized it as such. When I was examining you know, the items and picking off hairs and fibers, as I'm picking them off, I'm seeing them, but I may not know them for what they are as far okay. as it a tan carpet fiber. So it may have been there, but I didn't know until later that there was a tan carpet fiber there. You're not aware of anything that you picked off the glove that was a tan carpet fiber? Um, Sustain. Now, when you looked at the Rockingham glove, uh, one of the things that you told us you did is that you removed some debris from the wrist area. Yes. And describe that debris to me again. Um, I believe it was hairs and fibers. And um, as I recall, it was um, kind of stuck to the glove. On um, the inside or the outside, do you know? On the outside. Now, you indicated that the wrist was folded up 
and disturbed in some fashion, I think, is what you said. Remember that? Yes. And when you say folded up, do you mean that it looked like it had been maybe turned over as if someone were looking at the edging or the seam or the inside part around the wrist? No. How do you mean folded up? I mean the like the the hem was kind of pulled out of out of shape. It was distorted. And then you you did examine the hem itself and saw that some of the uh, the, the thread from the hem had been taken out. Yes. Do you know who did that? Um, no. So you don't know whether that was done by uh, Dennis Fung or Andrew Mazzola or Colin Yamauchi before you got the glove? Um, I don't know if it was done by anyone or whether that was just damage to the glove that existed when it was collected. Have you ever seen a picture of the Rockingham glove after it was collected from Rockingham and after it got to the lab, but before it got to you? Yes. And where have you seen that picture? Um, I, I probably looked at it when I was in the lab. Um, I think Dennis Fung had some photographs of the gloves taken after collecting it, but before I got it. After collecting it at the lab? The pictures were taken at the lab. And these were pictures that, when were you, when were you shown those pictures? Um, I don't know. It was sometime actually after I had um, examined the gloves. Uh, so you're, do you know whether those pictures were taken before or after he examined the Rockingham glove at the lab? That I don't know. Now, in the bag with the Rockingham glove, was there a hair bindle that had been removed by Dennis Fung? No. Do you remember the, the pictures that you saw of the glove at the lab before you got it? Did it have Colin Yamauchi's initials uh, around the wrist area? I don't recall. Did it have any cuttings taken out of it? <clears throat> 